Amen. All right, well, grab a seat. <clears throat> and uh, so, so today, well, you're going to see what we'll do here in just a little, in a minute or so. But a couple weeks ago, we had on a Sunday evening our membership class, and we invited anybody who wanted to become members or even just to learn more about the church and what we believe, how we do things around here. Had a great class. We learned a lot. And at the end of it, several of our folks said, yeah, this is, I want, I want to play for this team. I'm ready to come out of the bleachers, put on a jersey, and, uh, and play for the team. And so let's, I want to become a member. And uh, and several of you are here today, and I want to introduce some of our brand new members. And so if you took the class and you signed the, uh, signed the membership covenant, you said, I want to be a member, come on down, and I want to introduce you to... Okay, there's at least two of you, so come on, come on now. Um, there's not. Uh, Gloriana, you might... Okay, Gloriana, you got lucky. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. All right. Chuck's making his way. Anybody else? I thought... All right, I guess. Oh, Nate and Randa, come on. Yeah, yeah, you too, you too. All right, so let me introduce you to a few, uh, few folks. So um, Gloriana, been attending the church for, well, quite a while, but took the membership uh, class 12 years. 12 years. All right, see, it's never too late to join. Some of you are like, oh, I've been too... <laughs> Gloriana's leading the way, right? So said, I want to... You've been serving in so many ways and involved and active and said, joining the team, officially become a member. So Gloriana Roberts, welcome. <laughs> Nate and Miranda are uh, longtime Nazarenes as well and transferred their membership in. And you're going to want to, uh, if you haven't had a chance to get to know Nate and Miranda, you want to, uh, you want to get to know them as well. So Miranda Plyler, welcome. There you go. Nate Plyler, welcome, brother. And then uh, Chuck, you've been a Nazarene since like long time, right? We'll run out of numbers for that. And uh, no, Chuck, uh, many of you know Chuck. So Chuck is a, uh, has been a Nazarene pastor, served several congregations, and recently retired from the Canby, Oregon Church of the Nazarene, and moved back here, kind of home, and lots of grandkids to hang out with. And uh, Chuck and Sue um, transferred their membership back here. And um, again, you're going to you know, all these guys, here's what I want you to do, and here's why we introduce them, because you need to get to know them. They're great folks with a great story, and uh, you've probably seen their faces around. I've just given you a name so you don't have to be embarrassed of not knowing their name, even though you've, you know, seen them 20 Sundays. But you, now you can just come, and I want you to welcome them, get to know their story. They are great folks. And so, Chuck and I, welcome. And uh, when you see Chuck, I'll give you Sue's as well. His wife, Sue, um, is, wasn't able to be here today, hanging out with sick grandkids, I think it is. So, yeah, yeah, being, being a good grandma. So, Chuck and Sue die. So, hey, welcome these guys. Let's celebrate. <laughs> Thank you, guys. God is, uh, God is up to some good stuff. Um, Today, here's what we're going to do today. We're going we're to revisit our vision and values. Um, you, you know, it's, it, churches, companies, others will put, uh, well, you know, it's a lot of folks, you've, you've probably been at work before, create a mission and mission statement, core values, all that stuff, and they put it up on the wall, rah, 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 celebrate it, and then forget about it and go on with everyday life as if it never happened, right? And, and then, and, and it doesn't really become meaningful, and a couple of months ago, we shared our, this, this vision that God has given us to help everyone live your full potential in Christ, and we need to just revisit it regularly and see how are we doing and living this out, and so today we're going to revisit, and uh, we're going to celebrate some good things that God is doing in our midst. We're going to celebrate how we've taken a few steps forward, and, um, and, then, there, and then there's an encouraging message from God's Word for you today. Um, just real quick, though, let me just, just a shameless plug for next weekend. Um, we're going to start a brand new four-part series on the subject of relationships. I want you to think about it. It's going to get really personal and very simple, but, but it's a challenge, though. Um, think about a relationship you have where it, it's good, but it definitely could be better. And we've got a plan for you of how you can take that relationship from good to better. Maybe you have a relationship in your life that is struggling, maybe even toxic, and we've got a plan for you. The same plan that can take a relationship from good to better can take that relationship from toxic to healthy and see some improvement. In fact, um, we're going we're gonna to kind of bring the best of God's truth with social research from a Christian perspective. And what the research has shown is that those who take these three 
three, do three simple acts, have seen 89% of folks who take the challenge and do it on a daily basis have seen improvement in the relationship that they decided to focus on. And so um, I invite you to join us. Um, maybe this week you'll have, be in conversation with somebody who's complaining about someone else in their life who's just a pain in the neck, you know? And you'll say, hey, guess what? My pastor is talking about that this week, and he has a plan to help us. Um, come to church with me. It's, it's intended to be very practical, very helpful, um, and based solely, solidly on God's Word. So that's next weekend. We'll kick it off, and um, just j- let's make the most of it and uh, invite a friend to join you. But for this weekend, again, we're going to revisit these uh, our vision and our values. So to do this, we, we read this and kind of proclaimed it together a couple months ago. Let's do it again here. This is, this is the vision and values that we, we have discerned that God wants us to celebrate and be all about. So read this with me. But again, let's not just read the words. Let's like read it, with, read it like we believe it. Okay, here we go. We all reach full potential when we love people recklessly, serve others contagiously, and pursue God passionately. We shared this for the first time a few months ago, so let me ask you, how are you doing? Still hot after it? Still hot after it? All right, there you go, there you go. Let, let me just ask, maybe I'll ask you this way, what, what, what keeps us from reaching and living our full potential? I, and I bet if we were honest, we'd say it's fear. Fear and apprehension that what I sense God is leading me to, that it's so big, it's so crazy, I don't know if I can do it. And if that is you, I mean, welcome to, well, in a good way, like, welcome to what all of us face on a regular basis. It's usually fear of, of, some, of, some, of some part. You know, when we do, can I ask people, what's your greatest fear? You could probably imagine the greatest fear, most popular greatest fear, is the fear of public speaking. In fact, all of our, like, membership folks, new members, if I had told them, take the class, and then you're just going to come on up in front of the church, pass the microphone down, and tell us in two minutes what you're all about. Folks have been like, ah, I think I need to pray about membership a little bit more. Um, I'll get back to you on that one, right? Because nobody wants to do it. It's our number one greatest fear. And we look at people like pastors or politicians or others who are public speaking regularly and regularly hear folks like, oh, how do you do that? I could never do that. I'm scared to death. And there's the assumption that those of us who do that regularly have no fear. Well, let me tell you, the folks I've talked to who do this on a regular basis say there is regularly fear. That, that it's not that we're not afraid, it's just that God's power working in us is greater than our fears. Now, it's not just the preachers and the politicians. There's some folks you have heard of who struggled with public speaking, speaking in public. Um, Warren Buffett well-known, like, uber-billionaire and all that, would tell you that when he was a young man, he was deathly afraid of getting up and speaking in public, and yet he does it all the time. Joel Osteen says that when he was 36 years old and he had been serving behind the scenes of his dad's ministry and had his first opportunity to take the stage and speak and preach, he was scared to death. Now, you don't have to agree with all of his theology, but we, we kind of would admit that, you know, um, he, he does speak to the largest gathering congregation in the United States every week, and he does a pretty good job of it. I mean, it might be, you know, it might help a little bit that he has like a beautiful smile and incredibly, you know, perfect hair, but that could help a little bit. Um, <laughs> but even he would say that he struggled with fear of public speaking. Mahatma Gandhi Incredible anxiety, almost just could not do it and tried to get out of it. Uh, um, uh, one that you, well known, well known for his influence and his public speaking is Abraham Lincoln. And the story that goes that as a, a local politician speaking out against slavery, delivered a really great speech locally about the dangers of slavery spreading across the United States and that uh, the national political leadership began to notice him and recognize him as a potential national leader. And they invited him to speak at a national gathering and he was so scared and so overcome with anxiety that he made up an excuse about why he needed to return home early so that he could get out of having to give the speech. Of course, he went on to share some incredible speeches and be a great leader and bring great change. All of these that we've, that we've showed here, they overcame their fears. How? Because they had a cause that was greater than their fears. And then the, the, their passion for the cause that they believed in pushed them to face their fears and to take bold steps. And we would say, even if we disagree with a lot of their life and some of their beliefs, that they lived their full potential. 
So what keeps you from living your full potential in Christ? Where does fear come into it? That's what we're going to talk about this weekend. We're also, as I said, we're going to celebrate a little bit of how our church has continued to move forward in some of the things that God has wanted us to be as we help people live full potential and as we as a church family take some steps forward to to, to live our vision of full potential and the values of loving people recklessly, serving others contagiously, pursuing God passionately. So this week, I was in uh, Nampa, Idaho, on the campus of Northwest Nazarene University for a couple of things, and one of those was uh, I'm on the planning committee for a major regional pastors conference, and so we came together to help plan it. And also on the committee was a guy, a, a guy by the name of Brian Thomas. I don't know if you've ever met him or heard of this guy at all. Uh, <laughs> um, apparently, we were in seminary together, but we were both working full-time school and didn't really get to know each other too well back then, a long, long time ago. But uh, So if you don't know, inside joke, Brian was the pastor here uh, before me and um, had a chance to finally meet him and have some conversations and uh, get to know him a little bit and hear his heart. And then we, part of the conversation, Scott was there for part of it, is we're celebrating some of the good things that God has been doing in our church family. And so, of course, I shared with him, that uh, last summer that we were able to bring Randy Mead on full-time as our children's director. And uh, I don't know, I can't remember his exact words for it, but his eyes lit up and he smiled and he said, we landed a superstar. I, I think that's it. And, and moms and dads of kids, if you've had, you know, if you have kids in our kids' ministry and Ridge Kids' ministry, you are, I mean, you're experiencing that, right? You are seeing that God has blessed us with a superstar. Uh, and you know, Randy... It's not just that we, we made a great hire. It's that God did a great thing. Like, Randy is taking steps and living the calling that God has placed on his heart. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, he met with our district credentials committee and told his story and shared his story. And at our district assembly here in a couple months, um, he will be given his first district minister's license, and we will we'll be able to refer to him as Pastor Randy. Why? Because he's taking steps along the journey, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, our, our, our church board recognized that if you're in Ridgefield, Washington, where families with kids by the, are moving in by the hundreds, you make a big investment in kids' ministry. And this is more than just one full-time position. And our church board is committed um, to, to having, to just investing in the leadership we need and to staff it correctly so that we can reach kids and families. And uh, from the beginning, we said, Let's, this is a time and a half or time and a quarter role. And so um, Chelsea served great in that role. And then when she stepped back, we, uh, we said, okay, God, who do, you, um, who, who do you have for us? We need someone to come alongside Randy and be his programming assistant and give uh, specific leadership in early childhood especially and help with curriculum development, all that kind of you know, boring stuff. I know you don't care about the details. But th the best part is like, who is the right person? And God led us to the right person. And so late last fall, um, you just met Miranda, Nate and Miranda, a little bit ago. So uh, Miranda has great experience in early childhood leadership, and she is an incredible leader. And she, we brought her on staff and have hired Miranda as our programming assistant to come alongside and work with Randy and continue to make an investment. And we've rebranded our early childhood to be Ridge Kids Junior. So there's Ridge Kids Junior, nursery, early childhood, preschool, age, and then there's Ridge Kids um, elementary age, and just, we want to make a big investment. And so again, I was, um, I was at this meeting this week. One of the guys who's now a district leader in Idaho, he used to be the pastor up at Bremerton, and I met him, got introduced, and he looked at me, and he's like, you're in Ridgefield. He's like, oh, a couple of our people are down there. And Nate and Miranda, they are awesome, and you are so lucky to have them. And I was like, yeah, we are so lucky and blessed to have them. God is just like, God's doing great things, and, and, and just God is blessing us with so many great things and some great leaders. In fact, I have one more for you today. This is like, it's so fun I can go public with this for now. Um, we've been working on it and talking about it as... Uh, <clears throat> As, as, we, uh, as we shared a couple months ago that um, Frida is moving to a halftime role, and so we're looking for someone to oversee connections. Because one of the things that's really important as a church family is to, to, to connect with each other and build relationships. And, and maybe you remember back to that first time you came and that your first Sunday here and how a church full of strangers, that's, it's, it's hard to go from like everybody's stranger to build friends and acquaintances and, and build relationships. And so we said, you know what, we need a high level staff member who will oversee that whole process to help people get connected and get involved in small groups and ministry and serving together and building relationships. And so we are incredibly excited to announce that she just started. We're bringing her on staff. Um, 
that our brand new connections director is Sadie Shapovalov. She's probably not even in here. Yeah, that's exciting. Where is she? She's not. She's out in the lobby talking to somebody or something. I don't know. You know, connecting with somebody. <laughs> No, 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 we're really excited, right? And part of what, part of what she's going to do as well is, and she has been, helping start brand new small groups. In fact, in the last couple of months, we have started four brand new small groups where people can get connected with each other. And what happens in small groups? Well, I'll tell you what happens in small groups. We love people recklessly. One of our groups right now is working to love recklessly and gather and support one of their small group members who's struggling and going through a hard time right now. That that we gather and we serve others contagiously and we serve together. Um, Our our, our kids right now down in Kids Church are meeting the large group worship and then they gather in their small groups by age. And Randy plans like these serve contagiously events where with their kids' small group, they go and they serve and do more than just life together in church, but outside of church as well. And then our small groups open up their Bibles, and they hear from God, and they encourage each other to live out the truth. So it's not just truth we believe, but it's truth we live out, and we encourage each other to live it out, and small groups pursue God passionately together. This is what we do. And it's really fun to talk about making some progress and taking some steps in that direction. You see, here's what we believe, that with every step you take, you're taking one more step on the path of living your full potential. We want you to reach and live every day your full potential. So with that, we've also rebranded so that all of our messaging can be consistent with this vision of full potential living and the values that go along with it. And so this fall, we worked really, really hard and lots of conversations and emails and all the other to to, to really be able to visually represent who we are. And so here is our brand new church logo and branding look. And I want to just look real close. Can you see the vision and values simply expressed in this little icon? It's the mountain and the path that leads you there. Illustrated there by three little dots, because we love people recklessly, serve others contagiously, pursue God passionately. And so my goal is that when you see this, that you are reminded, let's take a step towards living full potential in Christ. In fact, um, our, our vendor had a really good deal on these this last week, and so I've got about 30 more of them. And if you, you want one, Kendall? Will you take a step of living your full potential? You're not... Peyton, I said it wrong. I owe you two of them now. Will you take a step and live in your full potential? All right, here you go. Put it on your laptop. Save the other one for your car when your dad buys you a car when you're 16. And uh... <laughs> hey, I've got more of them. And if you would say, okay, I'm going to take a step on this pathway to live with my full potential in Christ, and um, you put this somewhere. I'll give you one. I want to give them away. They're not to be just put, kept and stacked. Let's give it away. Let's share it, and let's just let's live our full potential. Because, I mean, we're celebrating some staff and leadership roles, but, but here, here's, here's the deal. Like, living your full, full potential is not about a job or a paycheck. A, a few of us are lucky enough that that, that is a part of it. But the reality is you can be a leader. You can be an influencer for the kingdom of God. And that can happen in church, but most often it happens also at school. It happens at work where you can be an influencer for the kingdom of God. That it happens in our community. See, there's a whole bunch of people who, motivated by their love for Christ and their community, live out their full potential as coaches and leaders on baseball fields, soccer fields, and other areas and venues where God leads us. It's for all of us. Here's what we're going to hear from God today. There's a guy named Moses. He's probably the greatest leader of God's people in the Old Testament before Jesus. And when God came to Moses, he was a runaway and he was full of fear and had made some bad decisions. And God says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of slavery in Egypt into the land I want you to give them. And Moses' response was just like all of our response when God puts his calling in our lives. Who, me? 
why me? Not me, Lord, I can't do it. And God says, I know you can't do it, but I can. And I'll go before you and you can do it. And Moses has all these excuses of why he's afraid and he's unequipped and unqualified. And God says, I'll do it through you. And Moses reluctantly agrees. And God uses Moses to lead his people out of slavery of the strongest empire in the world at that time. Miraculously by his hand, he leads them out and they are free and they're heading to the land that God has to give them. And Moses realizes the, 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 the pain of leadership. That this group of people who has just seen God's power miraculously come through for them, they, they come through and they come through the, the Red Sea, they go out to the wilderness and they're making their way up to the land that God has given them and they get thirsty and can't find water for, you know, 14 minutes or something. And they start grumbling and complaining and they find some water and it's bitter and they're just like, nah, bitter water, why Moses, you know, why would you lead us out here? God gives them food, they don't even have to grow it, they just go out and like gather it up on the ground and eat it. And it's like, man... All we have is bread and more bread every day. Why can't we have some meat? And they're complaining, you know, God sends them meat. And then the next day, they're traveling some more. A little while later, they get thirsty again. They can't find water. And they're like, Moses, why'd you lead us out here? We're so thirsty. And we'd be better to, to be slaves in Egypt again. We had all the meat we could ever want there and water. And, you know, they're complaining. And, and Moses, I mean, he's frustrated. Just like you're frustrated when you're, you're leading people and you're leading people well and you say, I'm not a leader. Yeah, if you're a parent, you're a leader, right? You're an influencer over some incredibly precious individuals who can be shaped for good or for not. And you're a leader. And you felt the leadership pressure when like your kids are like, I'm starving. I'm famished. You're such a cruel parent because you don't feed me. I'm starving to death. And you're like, I know, like, man, lunch was 26 minutes ago. Ha, ah, I'm a terrible parent. And that's, I mean, that's what Moses is facing. And he's frustrated. The weight of leadership. And, and then the Amalekites, the group of people that they're kind of close to, they attack. And Moses is like, oh, man. More problems, more pressure. And God gives Moses a gift. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. The Amalekites came and they attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses is like, well, we've got to defend ourselves. Who's going to lead the way? So Moses said to Joshua, hey, Joshua, choose some of our men. Go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands, hands grew tired, they took a stone. They put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Here's what's happened. This is the first time in the story that we hear of this young man named Joshua. I don't know how it came, out, but it came about, but I think it came about like this. Moses realizes there's a need, and we need somebody to kind of lead the way, and he's been noticing this young man, Joshua. Moses knows that, that he, he is not going to lead the way with the sword, um, and so he sees a young developing leader that's showing some potential, and he says, Joshua, lead the way, and Joshua gets an opportunity, and Joshua takes the opportunity, and I can just, I mean, I bet my life that Joshua was scared and afraid, but believing that God was going to help them out just as he had always helped them out, he goes ahead and he leads his people to victory. And look what God does at the end of it. Verse 17, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write it down on a scroll as something to be remembered. we got to remember this day. And look at the next phrase. I love this. Great. And make sure Joshua hears it. Now, why would God want to make sure that Joshua heard what they were talking about that day? Make sure Joshua hears it because I'll completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built the altar. He called it, The Lord is my banner the Lord has gone out ahead of us. God says, make sure Joshua knows about it. Because on the day he was given an opportunity, rather than cowering in fear, rather than being overcome and, and missing the opportunity, as many of us have done, right? We get that opportunity in fear, indecision, whatever it may be, and we're like, ah, I don't know if I'm up for the job. Who, me, why me? And we miss our opportunity. I've done it, you've done it. But on this day, Joshua didn't miss the opportunity. And he comes through and he sees the power of God. And God says, here's a young man. Pour your life into him, Moses. And make sure he never forgets this day when God came through. 
And so Joshua stays with Moses and be, kind of becomes his apprentice. Moses pours his life into young Joshua. In fact, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, to receive the laws and the Ten Commandments and all that, everybody else stays down in the camp. Goes, guess who goes with Moses and gets to see this incredible interaction between God and Moses? Joshua. We see that Joshua is a young, immature leader. When Joshua hears noise down in the camp, he just assumes that it's war, and he runs to Moses and says, Moses, there's war in the camp. And Moses says, no, my young, immature leader, not everything is war. This is even worse. It's rebellion. And he's got to help his young apprentice work through and read situations and learn to become a leader. And together they come up with the plan, and they seek the Lord together. And Moses invests himself in Joshua. Now think about this. Who gets the greater blessing out of this, Moses or Joshua? Man, I'm voting for Joshua, right? Like, if you're the young leader and you have Moses himself investing in him, investing in you and pouring his life into you, you are the recipient of an incredible blessing. But here's what I've discovered, too. That when you're the one investing in a young leader, an up-and-coming leader, when you're the one pouring your life into someone, even though that's a lot of give, and even though it's exhausting, and even though they don't always listen, and there's like pride and arrogance, and for you, there is a blessing that comes when you're the one pouring yourself into that's maybe even greater than the blessing than the one who is being poured into. Fast forward to Numbers chapter 13. They're right up on the edge of the land that God has given them. Moses says, we need to form a small reconnaissance team to go in and check out and spy out the land so that we can plan our attack and go in and take the land God has given us. We need one, we need one leader from each tribe. Twelve men. Guess who's one of the twelve? Joshua. Moses says, Joshua, you're going to be the leader, the representative of your tribe. This party of 12, they go in and they check out the land, and they come back, and there is fear on their faces, and they say, the men in this land, they are tall as giants. We felt like grasshoppers in their eyes. And 10 of them said, we felt like grasshoppers in their eyes. There's no way we can defeat them and take their land. Why did you lead us? Let's just go back to Egypt. Two people say no. Yes, they're strong, and yes, they're big, and yes, we're a little bit afraid, but no. While we are small and they are big, we believe in a God who is bigger. And if God leads us and goes before us, we can do this. Guess who's one of the two? Joshua. Unfortunately, two don't outvote ten, and the people went with the ten. And God says, because you're going with the ten instead of the two who are trusting me, you're going with the ten who live in fear. You're just going to wander for 40 years, and your generation of leaders will pass away. And at the end of the 40 years, when the next generation is here who will trust in me, we'll try this again. And there's two men of the current generation who get to go in, and it's Joshua and Caleb, the other guy who had gone with him. Fast forward, quite a bit of time. It's near the end of Moses' life. Numbers chapter 27, verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain in the Abarim range, and I want you to see the land that I have given to the Israelites. After you've seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. You're, you're going to pass away. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. The waters at Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. You can, you can read about that. You, you should. And Moses said to the Lord, okay, I'm going to pass away. I know it. But may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, may he appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in so that the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. He's like, I know these people. They will be scattered the minute I'm gone. They need a good leader who will be a shepherd to them. Lord, will you appoint a leader and guess who God has in mind? Oh, you're so smart. Look, verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun. Now look at how God talks about Joshua. A man in whom is the spirit of leadership. Lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. 
Give him some of your authority so that the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eliezer the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. And at his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out. And at his command, they will come in. And so Moses did as the Lord commanded. He took Joshua. He had him stand before Eliezer the priest and the whole assembly of the people. Then he laid his hands on him. And he commissioned Joshua just as the Lord had instructed through Moses. Now, this is a great spiritual moment. This is like graduation day. But for years, Moses has been pouring himself into Joshua. Oh, Joshua had the spirit of leadership. But just because you have the calling or a little bit of a gifting doesn't mean that you, that you, you don't need to work hard and develop that gift and develop those skills and develop those abilities and mature those giftings and abilities and skills so that you can effectively lead with wisdom. And Joshua has gone with Moses all these years and he's ready to take the lead. So Joshua does it. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 7. Moses summoned Joshua, and he said to Joshua in the presence of all Israel, so he gets all the people together, and he says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. This is his charge to Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself, he goes before you, and he will be with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And he commissions Joshua in the presence of all the people. They read the law again. And Moses goes up on the mountain. And he passes away. Go to spend eternity with God. And the people are in good hands with a good shepherding servant leader who will lead them effectively. Because God has called and Moses has developed and poured into him. And God still does that. That's just one story among many all through scriptures of where God calls a man or a woman. And then the community of Jesus followers pours into them and develops them. You see, God calls people and then he expects us to develop the skills, the ability, and the character to fulfill that calling. God calls people, then he expects us to encourage them along the way and to follow them along the way, even to allow them to make some mistakes sometimes. God called me to preach and to lead a church. But let me tell you, in addition to his calling, he raised up people who have poured into me over the years before that calling and since that calling and continuing with that calling to be able to develop the skills and ability to be able to fulfill the calling that he has put on me. My story is similar to your story, or should be. And here's what God has told us. Here's what God has told us as a church. Develop people. And our job as pastors and staff members, our job as church leaders, is to do everything we can do to help every person live their full potential in Christ. To develop you and do everything we can help can do to encourage you and equip you and train you to live your full potential in Christ. Here's what we find that God regularly calls men and women and sometimes he calls men and women to pastor a church. Sometimes he calls men and women to invest in kids as a kids director, children's pastor. Sometimes God calls us to work a day job that will pay the bills so that we can invest in other places. Sometimes God calls us to hang drywall during the day and then on Sunday nights to invest in middle schoolers and senior hires, not just for a couple of months to help out the youth pastor, but for years to pour yourself into somebody. Sometimes God calls you to pour yourself into men in men's ministry. Sometimes God calls you to start a small group and just pour yourself into those people. Sometimes God calls you to serve. And it's not always like a huge leadership role. Usually the first assignment is, is, is a job that's hard and you serve and it's not always easy, easy and it's usually hard. But when God calls, you just go do it. What God has told us is we are to develop people. So we're starting to take some steps. We've got to process along the way. Here's another win that we can celebrate. So last fall, we launched the first of our Finders class, where folks could take a little online inventory, 
And then over the course of five to six weeks in class, Scott has shared and taught and led of how to understand how God has gifted you, has strengthened you to live your full potential. And so took the class, a bunch of people enjoyed it. We're going to share some of that next week of some of, uh, some of the testimonials about it. And now we're ready to offer it again. Um, and if you weren't able to take it the first time around, hopefully now your schedule will clear up. We're going to begin Tuesday night, February 19th. And you could sign up for that class today, learning what your strengths and how God has strengthened you. And then over the course of a few weeks, learn how to develop and activate those God-given strengths so that you can live your full potential. See, here's, what, here's the reality. Your full potential is different from mine. And I don't want you to mimic mine. I want you to live your full potential and be the man or woman God has made you to be to do the job only you can do. One of the, greatest, one of the best things we can do is celebrate like when God is working in people and they take a bold step. And we learn by the examples of others. Even if we don't copy them, we learn from them and are inspired by them. So last summer, last year about this time, as we were planning the Mexico mission trip, God inspired Shannon to sign up his whole family to go to Mexico. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, Tony sat down with him, heard his story. And I want you to hear Shannon's story today, but, but here's what I want you to hear. I want you to listen for the moving of God and the calling of God and how God has developed to serve contagiously, pursue God passionately, love recklessly. Just, just listen, listen very carefully and be inspired by Shannon's story. It's ironic that a mission trip to Mexico, where we're going down to build brick and mortar, becomes the vessel for uh, interaction of relationships that is really more in line with what the church is looking for in terms of vision. Well, going down, I thought the mission trip was really going to be about building, um, a focus on tangible brick and mortar construction. Um, but when I came back, what I really came to realize that it was it was 100% about relationships and the construction and the actually nailing of boards together was really just the vessel for uh, facilitating the relationship and, and the learning. The way that it impacted the people of El Rosario the most wasn't necessarily as much as what we were going to be doing for them as much as it was just the fact that we were there. Um, we'd been away for a while and they were so excited to see us. Just the fellowship um, was just as important to them. Ridgefield has been going down to El Rosario for several decades and we hadn't been down in, in recent years, so this is our, our first time back in recent years. And Raleigh, uh, who is, uh, runs the restaurant and the hotel and is an integral part of the, the community, uh, she was uh, aged and um, a little more frail than previous visits. And as I got up each morning, I did my Bible study and would uh, do some journaling until the restaurant opened at 6 a.m. And every morning at 6 a.m., Raleigh and her son-in-law, Gerardo, would open the, open the restaurant. And I would go in and finish my, my Bible study and my journaling. And uh, Raleigh would make her way around the restaurant with her cane because uh, she's walking very fragile. And after about three or four days of uh, uh, us all being there, I, I was sitting there drinking my coffee with Gerardo, and I, I mentioned to Gerardo, I said, do you see uh, Raleigh there? And he, he smiled and said, no, what? I said, she's not using her cane. And he just kind of smiled and said, you know, she's just so tickled that uh, we're here that it's really been a big boost for her emotionally after she had just lost her granddaughter to uh, lupus. So that was kind of a testimony to just exactly how much our presence meant to, to them. Well, coming back home, I would say that uh, the one takeaway I had specific to the kids is how much I really want to prep, uh, prepare for going back down there again so that we can, we can repeat and we can continue that, that tradition and, and outreach to those kids down there. And so in, in turn, it becomes a generational thing. Given the uh, community and the, the needs within that community, I, I don't think there's an, an end to what we can do down there. Uh, this next summer, we'll be going down to finish what we started within the, the church grounds, but uh, it became very evident that there were some needs that we were going to address. In, in particular, there was a home we're going to build. So 
Uh, we've already got the foundation laid uh, with the money we left behind. Uh, and that concrete foundation will be met with a uh, lumber package that will be ready for us when we get down there. So this year the, our approach will be twofold uh, to finish what we started, but also to start um, uh, the construction of a small home. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we have this, this beautiful coffee shop here. Uh, it's, you know, incredibly well built, uh, fancy, but uh, what we left behind down there in, in El Rosario wasn't even finished. Uh, we're sweeping up the sawdust and the, and the bent nails off the floor, and they're already using, uh, using the facility to hang pinatas. And uh, they were so overjoyed uh, with what we had left behind in the, in the preliminary stages of construction that uh, uh, they were already putting it to use with uh, great joy. The one thing that I can say about taking a mission trip to Mexico is it, it isn't about the uh, things that we're going to build. It really is the journey from the time we leave the parking lot here in Ridgefield until the time we return uh, from point A to point B back to point A again. Every step of the way is a opportunity to fellowship, to minister, and to uh, grow as an individual. I thought it was strictly going to be about going down there and providing for the less fortunate when in all actuality 100% of it was relationship. Uh, they were ministering to us just as much as we were ministering to them. Did you hear it? Did you hear about the work of God in and through some people? Taking some bold steps to live our full potential in Christ. And that was not, it was not just a promo for next week's informational meeting for the Mexico trip at 11.45. <laughs> not just a promo, even though you should, you should show up next week, 11.45, right here, check out information about the Mexico mission trip. Because maybe that's part of God's plan for your full potential living, to sign up your family. But whatever it is, what does God want from you? Just take the next step. What was Joshua's full potential? Lead God's people. He was a little bit afraid, but he took it step, every step of the way, and God went before him. What does God want for you? Maybe he leads God, God's people. Maybe not. What he wants from you is just take your next step. You see, the reality is the 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 journey of discovering, reaching, and living your full potential, it's not about the destination. It's about a long process of just following God as he leads you, developing you into the man or woman God wants you to be. And I don't want you to get to the top of the mountain tomorrow. I just want you to take your next step today. In fact, let me give you a little bit of encouragement. In the life of Joshua, we just summed up very quickly. But everything I just told you about Joshua, that took 40 years from the time he got an opportunity, the first opportunity, to his commissioning as the leader. That was a 40-year development process. Like God's willing to take the long, slow route because that's usually the best route. And so no, you don't have to be at the top of the mountain. I don't even want you to get to the top of the mountain tomorrow, but I just want you to take your next step. And I want you to hear and be encouraged by the words God gave to Joshua on day one as the leader. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. God says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Serve them contagiously. Love them recklessly, because they're going to complain and grumble and not like you and say things bad about you, but I want you to love them anyways. Be strong and courageous. You're going to do it. And... Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be very careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep your eyes on me. God says to Joshua, pursue me passionately and don't get distracted so that you can live your full potential. Pursue God passionately and be strong and be courageous. Yeah, you're going to be afraid, but fear doesn't have to win the day. Because I'm going to go out before you and out ahead of you and look fear in the face and take your next step. 
and just trust me with it. So how about you? Will you just take the next step and trust God with it? And let's see where God leads. Pray with me. God, thank you that you call us to be a part of your work around the world and in people's lives. God, I thank you that our faith is not just pray a prayer of salvation and then wait for you to take us to heaven, but that we get to be active and involved all along the way in the meantime. God, I thank you that you have plans for our lives that are so much better than any plans we could have come up with. So God, I pray. I pray for the person today who who really struggles with taking the next step because they want to see the whole rest of the way laid out before them. If they can't see the top of the mountain, they don't even want to take the first step. God, I pray, would you just speak a, a voice of encouragement and calm to their hearts and minds today to just trust you with the path and just to take the next step. Lord, I pray with, for, for the person who, who just can't seem to get past the fear of even taking the next step. Oh, God, I pray that you would, you would whisper encouragement to them and remind them that you are God and you are powerful and that you are, you're already going before them. You're already working in that area in which you're asking them to step into. Oh, God, encourage their hearts and minds today. Lord, you lead. We will follow. And God, we just look forward to continuing to celebrate all the great things that you do in us and through us, and we will be sure to give you the credit and the glory all the way. Oh, it's a privilege to be yours, Lord. We pray these things in your name today. All right, let's stand. Let's conclude that prayer by all of us raising our voices and singing in worship and proclamation that we'll serve, we'll love, we'll pursue all along the way. Lead us out of here, guys.